very good evening to all of you on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association 247 doc call service I would like to welcome all of you for this very important session today we are having this very important webinar on current situation and update of management of dengue the, as you may be aware SLMA 247 service has been conducting a yeoman service, especially during the COVID pandemic. And at uh, this time we felt that it's very timely that we focus on the other illnesses, including dengue as well. That's the reason that we have uh, started, uh, uh, decided to start today's webinar. And I would like to welcome and invite my co-moderator, Dr. Sajit Ediri Singh, who is also the convener of the 247 service, as well as the Secretary of Sri Lanka Medical Association, to introduce the speakers. Over to you, Dr. Sajit. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so today, uh, we will be starting uh, our webinar series uh, from 247 regarding the, uh, the current uh, pandemics and the uh, health issues. Uh, uh, in Sri Lanka. So today we will be discussing about uh, the dengue, uh, the rising uh, epidemic. So first, first of all, uh, to give an introduction to this webinar series and about the SLMA, I would like to uh, call upon our president, Dr. Vinyari Ratna, uh, to address the uh, audience. Over to mm -hmm. you, Dr. Vinyari. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Idri Singh. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of the SLMA, I would like to welcome all of you uh, who are attending this uh, webinar today on a very important public health issue. Uh, and also we have uh, eminent experts who are specialized in the management of dengue in Sri Lanka uh, as resource persons. Uh, as you all know, Sri Lanka Medical Association is an apex body of all doctors who work in all sectors specialists as well as non-specialists in Sri Lanka. And this year, 2023, our theme is towards humane healthcare, excellence, equity, and community. Now, dengue is a very uh, important public health issue in Sri Lanka, and we are considered a, a hyper-endemic country for dengue. So uh, we have to fo focus uh, on dengue, both from a public health point of view, but also uh, in the clinical management. And uh, uh, there had been advances made uh, in the management of dengue in Sri Lanka and around the world. And I think we, uh, have, we have a duty uh, to update all the doctors on the current uh, developments. So that is why we are having this update uh, on various uh, important public health issues. Uh, disease issues that we are faced with. So uh, as for SLMA, uh, we have been uh, organizing different fora uh, to educate our members as well as the public because we our mandate is twofold. Uh, it's serving the profession as well as serving the uh, nation. So today uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have the four experts, uh, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikram and Professor, uh, sorry, um, uh, the two uh, main resource persons, and of course, the two moderators, uh, Dr. Ananda uh, Vijay Vikram and Professor uh, Nilika Malavige, uh, to uh, update uh, you all uh, on the uh, dengue situation in Sri Lanka and its management. And I wish to uh, thank uh, the uh, uh, SLMA uh, doc call 247, Professor. Uh, Indika Karuna Tilaka, who has been spearheading this initiative for organizing uh, this webinar today. Thank you, and over to you, uh, Dr. Edri Singha, to continue. Thank you, sir. So tonight, uh, our first speaker is Professor Nelika Malavige, who is a professor in immunology uh, from Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sreja Ardhanapura. So she will be talking about uh, the molecular basis and the current trends in the serotypes and the la latest advancements in the investigations in this den dengue epidemic. Uh, over to you, madam. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sajid. Uh and uh, everybody at SLMA for inviting me to uh, this webinar. I think it's a very timely uh, need for this webinar. And just to highlight the need and why we are having this webinar, uh, I can, if I can just show two slides. 
So I'll just share my screen and, and show these two slides. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes? Yes, yes I can see. Yeah, okay, yes. all right. Yes, so um, uh, just, just to show uh, uh, where we are right now. So this data is from the epidemiology unit, uh, NDCU and the BDHS Western Province. Uh, and Sri Lanka has uh, 26,179 cases up to now, which half are from, from the Western province as usual, uh, all throughout uh, the, the past years, Western province has been having the major burden of dengue. And uh, so what is unusual about this year compared to previous years is if you look at this figure, uh, this is uh, only from the Western province data. And so this, uh, as you can see in the past years, uh, during February to April is, is a period where we actually don't have many dengue cases because we know that dengue is very seasonal and you have the dengue seasons starting from end of April going on till about, uh, you know, uh, tailing off end of July and again having an outbreak in uh, December, January. And that has been the pattern uh, which we have seen over and over again during the uh, past few years. And uh, what is unusual this year is uh, that uh, the, the, in January, uh, we more or less have the same number of cases as pre uh, year, previous years, but instead of going down, the, the number of cases coming down uh, by the end of January, what is happening is it is stabilizing. And we know that actually, um, because April is not indicated, the case numbers are going up. And, this uh, is, is an alarming situation, and the question is why uh, well, this is happening. So uh, in our university, we are very uh, working with very closely with the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. Uh, we have been working uh, on dengue in collaboration with NIIG for uh, about 15 years, and uh, our team daily goes to uh, NIID and, and gets samples. So the majority of samples uh, uh, for serotyping come uh, from NIID. And if you see, hope you can see what I'm showing here. Uh, anyway, uh, this is from uh, April last year, where you, you know uh, the yellow is dengue two. Dengue two was the predominant serotype, but with time, what happened was, uh, of course, dengue one went away. So, so last year uh, around this time, we had dengue two predominantly, a little bit of dengue one, and a little bit of dengue three. But what happened uh, during this uh, time is uh, dengue one, of course, is almost uh, non-existent anymore. Uh, dengue two is declining and we have dengue three emerging. Now, the problem with dengue three is um, the last time we had dengue three as the predominant serotype was before 2009. Uh, so before 2009, uh, we had limited uh, serotyping in Sri Lanka, but based on the data, before 2009, we had dengue two and three as predominant serotypes. And in 2009, we had dengue one emerging as the predominant serotype. And dengue one was the predominant serotype until mid 2016. And we know that dengue two emerged in mid 2016. And when we got this serotype shift of a new serotype emerging, uh, I, I guess you remember what happened in 2017 where uh, the case numbers did not go down and it continued and uh, there was a really massive outbreak with almost 200,000 cases reported during that year. Now, uh, so this serotype shift is worrying because uh, the Sri Lankan population has not uh, been exposed to dengue 3 for a while. So we have a large non-immune population who have not been infected with dengue 3. So there's a, a at risk, the at risk population to get infected with dengue three is, is uh, very high. The other, uh, the other thing is, I mean, this is not something that is unique to Sri Lanka. Uh, these serotype changes happen uh, from time to time throughout the world. And uh, many other countries in Southeast Asia, like Singapore and, and so, uh, Thailand and so on, are experiencing really massive outbreaks. So if you look at the news, you will see that Thailand is experiencing a massive outbreak after so many years. Uh, Singapore, despite its very uh, extensive vector control me uh, measures, is seeing uh, is uh, has shown that it's going to be outdo the record num uh, record number of cases that were seen in 2022. Uh, uh, so it's going to outdo that in 2023. 
Similarly, so countries in, in Asia is going to do that. And also in Latin America, the situation is quite bad as far as dengue is concerned. And in many Latin American countries, because they cannot, ha cannot handle the number of cases, they have, uh, you know, markets, dengue tents uh, put up in different places because the hospitals cannot handle the situation. So this dengue situation is not something unique to Sri Lanka. It is uh, all over the world. Everybody had a little bit of dengue free period during the COVID times. There were social restrictions, which actually were very effective for dengue, uh, restricting uh, mobility. But now, since life has gone back to normal, we have this increase in dengue cases. And I think Dr. Anand Vijay Vikram will speak about the, the clinical significance of it, because it's, it's not just dengue we have. We also have an influence outbreak going on, as all of you know. Uh, our lab has been uh, doing uh, influenza surveillance since last year. And during the November, December, January, we had H1N1 as the predominant uh, uh, you know, uh, influenza uh, uh, variant. And now it is H3N2, uh, similar to India, where the same influenza strain came. We, we have a similar pattern in Sri Lanka. And apart from that, we know that COVID also, this new uh, XBB 1.1.16 variant is uh, uh, coming up in uh, India and so many places. Hospitalization is less. But in early illness, uh, influenza, dengue, COVID, everything, uh, the clinical features are the same. So, and, but if you don't treat dengue at the right time, then you know, uh, certain things can uh, go wrong. So I won't talk more than that. Uh, I just wanted to highlight those things. And if anybody has questions, I'm happy to take now or later uh, after Dr. Anand Vijay Vikram speaks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, so the floor is open for discussion. Uh, so anyone is having uh, questions, uh, you, you can unmute yourself and directly ask from person Elika, and then we'll move on to the other speakers. Nelika, this change in um, the dengue types, does it have implications for mortality or, or the incidence of shock syndrome? Uh, yes, sir, because it, uh, now for mortality, uh, in the sense of for more severe disease, I think uh, mortality-wise, uh, Sri Lanka is handling dengue quite well when you compare to other countries. Uh, it, it is uh, sometimes shocking to realize uh, how bad other countries are handling dengue. So I think uh, our, because of our intense public health education and messaging to the public saying that come and see a doctor, uh, get yourself, you know, seen by a doctor in the first three uh, days. If you have fever for two days, see the doctor on the third day. Uh, that, that is a really important health message so that uh, then doctors take it up from there and, and assess it. So the mortality-wise, I think it won't be an issue uh, since we are, uh, even today, this is about training uh, doctors and making them aware. But of course, we can have higher disease severity because a lot of people have not had dengue three for a long time. And so uh, we can expect a cert certain degree of higher severity uh, that than the, you know, the, you know, like last year or previous year uh, as, as seen in some countries. I mean, uh, with dengue three, some countries are experiencing uh, these things. Okay, we have some questions. Uh, shall I answer this, Sally? There's a question from level yes, of possibility yes, yes. between serotypes. So uh, serotype one and three are quite a bit, I mean, there's more cross immunity between one and three than two and three. So uh, if, if somebody has dengue one very recently, that would cross, uh, protect against three for a longer time than two. But uh, as I mentioned, we have been having dengue two as the predominant serotype since mid 2016. So for the last, eight uh, years or eight, nine, you know, years, uh, it's been dengue two and dengue two doesn't offer much first protection against dengue three. Uh, the next question is, is there an increased risk of bleeding in dengue three compared to other serotypes? Uh, there is, uh, I mean, the serotype that tends to cause more milder disease is dengue four and which we are not seeing much, but there is no, uh, uh, as far as clinical features are concerned, uh, no differences in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, disease between one, two, and three. But having said that, certain strains of dengue 
might cause more bleeding, might cause more, more liver damage, and, or, or might cause more leakage. So it depends on each of the dengue uh, genotypes. Uh, so these four dengue viruses are completely four different viruses. And within them, like COVID, you know, like you have one COVID virus and so many different variants. Similarly, in each of these dengue viruses, you have so many different variants. Yeah, uh, Madam, I have a small question. So what are the facilities available at your unit uh, at Jadhanpura uh, to help the community and how uh, the community and the other doctors can approach your unit, Madam? Yes, so first of all, we are very closely working with the National Dengue Control Unit and the NIID. Uh, and uh, we are pr providing a serotyping data and so on. And th they're, they're sending samples. They have been sending samples from all over Sri Lanka whenever there is an outbreak. Uh, just to find out the serotype and the import, but uh, that is just to understand what is going. But more than that, what other countries do is uh, to have uh, you know all these data, uh, ongoing data, to see this shifting serotype very early so that you can act. Uh, and uh, the National Dengue Control Unit has been sending us samples. But what happened last year is, of course, we know that there was economic crisis and and you know transport issues. Uh, and also dollar crisis. And because of that, we we, we and them both had difficulties in uh, getting samples to us and testing, but all those problems we have solved. We have reagents to do uh, serotyping. We have also managed to sequence the dengue viruses because uh, we, we did sequencing of COVID, but now we have very successfully uh, sequenced the dengue viruses as well. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's important to understand uh, what is going on. Uh, in Sri Lanka, so we are very uh, we are very openly sharing all this data with the policymakers, which is the epidemiology unit and the national dengue control unit. Okay, so there is question about is there a approved dengue vaccine anywhere in the world? So there are two two approved vac vaccines. The first one was the Sanofi vaccine, which was approved uh, initially in Mexico in 2015 and subsequently in many countries. It had poor immunity to dengue two, and what what was shown that uh, immunity wanes with time. And actually when the vaccine was given to zero negative uh, individuals, when they actually got infected with dengue, they were more likely to develop CB disease. And uh, because of that, you know, uh, the Sanofi vaccine is not basically used because of disease enhancement or the vaccine actually acting as a primary infection. Now there's another vaccine, uh, the Takeda vaccine. Takeda has been approved by Indonesia, Brazil, European Medical Agency, uh, and it is uh, appears to be more immunogenic, has high protection against dengue 2, but uh, the efficacy against dengue 3 is uh, quite a bit limited. Uh, so it has, uh, the vaccine has, uh, based on the available data, uh, published data, the vaccine uh, seems to have a poor efficacy against dengue 3. And uh, so that is one issue. So, um, you know, unlike COVID vaccines, where there is just one virus, you know, one virus where you have to work against, Dengue is more complicated because we have four different viruses, and this is why it has been difficult to uh, for everybody to develop vaccines against dengue. Okay, so there's a question. If a patient was infected with dengue 2 recently, is there a higher risk of disease severity if he contracts dengue 3? So if anybody gets any infection with any serotype recently, uh, you get you know, cross protection against all serotypes for a particular period of months, like maybe nine months or a year or something, you, you are unlikely to get infected with another serotype. But as immunity wanes with time, then you can get infected with a different serotype, which may lead to CV disease. But in the vast majority, we know that the vast majority of people who are infected with dengue uh, have uh, mild illness. Think there are no more questions. Uh, if there are questions, you can directly ask uh, from Professor Nilika because uh, Dr. Anand Vijay Vikram will join with us in another five minutes' time. So we have another five minutes to uh, get the clarifications done. So if I can say, say something, Sajid, uh, while we are waiting yes, for yes. Dr. Anand Vijay Vikram. Now, because people are asking about dengue vaccines, uh, 
when you look at all the dengue vaccine data, they seem to be, uh, the efficacy seems to be less in seronegative individuals. And uh, when you look at the data in Colombo, I mean, we have been doing uh, seroprevalence studies in, in Colombo. Uh, we, in our university, we have done two, two the epidemiology unit uh, led by Dr. Hasita Tisera did, did a, uh, has done several in Colombo. The last one uh, he did uh, with uh, Dr. Gauss was in 2017. And we do have very high seroprevalence rates in Colombo uh, with, with the vast majority of uh, people being infected. And, Basically, around 40 years of age, almost everybody is infected. But that doesn't mean that the same data applies to the rest of the country. So because of this, uh, and because these dengue vaccines were coming up, the WHO supported us, funded us, to do island-wide zero surveillance. Actually, the island-wide zero surveillance, in, they, we, we, uh, the, the need was for COVID. But because we were collecting samples, we did it for COVID and dengue. And so we did it in the nine provinces, selecting one district from each province with the proportionate sampling. So uh, the districts which had higher uh, some uh, number of uh, population or population density, there were more samples collected. And we have just finished the assays. And uh, by we haven't finished analyzing the data. We should be able to release in about two or three weeks. By just looking at the data, the zero prevalence rates in the rest of the country seem to be very much different from Colombo. So this is, uh, and uh, it is important to understand this uh, when you're rolling out vaccines, uh, something that uh, is applicable for Colombo because of high seroprevalence rates, uh, you can't generalize, generalize to the rest of the country. So uh, we, we will share that data as soon as we finish analyzing it. Thank you. So there's a question from, uh, uh, is antibody enhancement theory still valid in describing leaking. Yes, antibody enhancement theory, uh, it, it is a reality, unfortunately. It is not the only reason people develop severe dengue. There are many reasons why some people develop severe dengue, but antibodies are important. And this is why, uh, for instance, with the Sanofi vaccine, when the Sanofi vaccine was given to zero negative kids, uh, when they actually got dengue because of this antibody dependent enhancement, they were more likely to develop CB disease. And so, yes, unfortunately, the ADE, antibody dependent enhancement, does uh, uh, play a role uh, in, in causing vascular leakage and thus leading to CB disease. So, what about the second vaccine? Will it also do the same thing or it's different? Uh, the, well, the Takeda vaccine, uh, it has. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it, it seemed to, it does have good immunity against dengue too, but uh, again, the dengue uh, immunity against dengue seems to be waning with time, uh, especially against dengue free. Uh, so uh, it doesn't provide equal immunity to all four serotypes. So then, uh, so we need to see more data and I believe that the study is ongoing. So uh, we need to see data to actually understand how the Takeda vaccine performs. No, what I meant was, will it also act as an infection in zero negative patients and enhance uh, illness subsequently? Uh, there is a risk of that happening. Uh, this is why we need to see the safety, long term safety data from, from dengue vaccines. That's why it is important for a vaccine like dengue. Whereas, if everybody remembers for COVID, the vaccines were just pushed and everybody got vaccinated because that was not a risk with COVID. Whereas uh, for dengue, we need to see long-term data. It's a very different disease. It's a in infection because of uh, the four different viruses. Thank you. So there's a question of whether there are antiviral uh, therapies validated. So the, of course, we, do, we don't have any treatment for dengue. Uh, the, how uh, people are treated is, of course, actively suspecting that in an outbreak that everybody has dengue and monitoring and uh, admitting when uh, you know people uh, tend to have you know risk of developing uh, vascular leakage or complications and fluid management and with this approach uh, Sri Lanka has uh, achieved a remarkable you know I mean the mortality rates in Sri Lanka are remarkably good and we and that's something we need, need to be proud of but having said that you know if, if there was a treatment uh, everybody's job could be so much easier and especially for the patients for the healthcare workers for the poor health system 
uh, it would be really good. So uh, there are many people uh, looking at uh, drugs and actually I am, uh, apart from being attached to the university, I'm also attached to the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, which is a global uh, uh, organization uh, based in Geneva with officers in all the regions. And dengue has been included in their portfolio and I am leading the global dengue program. And uh, so we are working, we have formed the Dengue Alliance, uh, uh, Global Dengue Alliance, which I'm heading, which, uh, which uh, partners from India, Malaysia, Thailand, Brazil, and dengue endemic countries. So we have a preclinical working group, clinical working group, uh, and so on to look at drugs, the clinical working group, uh, designing trials, Dr. Anand Vijay Vikrama is uh, in the clinical working group from Sri Lanka. Uh, so, uh, we are getting close to this, but it's, of course, uh, a, a big uh, effort uh, to, to uh, get there. So there's another question. What will happen to the stupidity of illness if you get infected with the dengue virus for the term, third time? So most of the dengue infections, when you get it for the third time, is, uh, tends to cause asymptomatic or very mild illness. But having said that, there are individuals who have developed dengue hemorrhagic fever uh, when they have been infected for the third time. So uh, these things can happen, yeah. I see a hand up from uh, uh, Mr. Professor Shamia. Yeah, 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 Dr. Shamia. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, Neelika, uh, now the zero prevalence in the Western province, you said is very high. Yes. So sir. the vaccine, if at all, will not be indicated in the Western province. Is, is that correct? I mean, if you're giving the vaccine, the Western province would be the best place to give it because there is high zero prevalence and we don't know whether people have been infected multiple or uh, once or several times. Uh, so there is very uh, almost very limited risk of disease enhancement if you vaccinate the uh, Western province. But having said that, we know that uh, the uh, the uh, prevalence, zero prevalence in Kalutara district might be low given the uh, case incidence in Kalutara. Uh, so um, uh, we are also looking at uh, doing this study in the Western, uh, in Colombo actually, to see if people are infected with one serotype or several serotypes. But if you take a place like, I don't know, Badul or Kandy or, you know, places like that, where people have never been exposed to dengue, and if there is a vaccine which may enhance disease and you vaccinate zero negative individuals, and if by any chance the vaccine enhances disease, such individuals might uh, get more uh, severe disease. So this is why we have to carefully look at data uh, to, uh, to make these decisions. You, you, these are you know, carefully thought, you have to carefully think, uh, go through all the data uh, to, to decide. Um, but if the zero prevalence is high, that means we have some kind of immunity. Is that correct? Uh, uh, we, we have some kind of immunity, uh, but we know that uh, although the zero prevalence is high, half of the cases in Sri Lanka are reported from the Western province, which the majority is from uh, Colombo. So uh, there is some uh, data again that people might be reinfected with the zero type as well. As far as I know, there are certain uh, publications which will be published soon from other countries showing that, uh, that you know, people can get reinfected with the same zero type which is a disappointment. Uh, and this lifelong immunity may not be a rea reality in some. Uh, so, so this is one issue. The question really is, is the vaccine indicated if the zero prevalence is very high in a particular province? It, or... it, 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 it would be because uh, then vaccine would provide some sort of immunity uh, because people tend to get, uh, you know, uh, Get, get infected with, let's say in Colombo, you have 100% zero positivity at, I don't know, 30 years of age, and people have only been infected with one zero type. In such an instance, giving the vaccine to them would be safe because there is very unlikely to be disease enhancement, and the vaccine works very well in zero positive people because we know that such people, then when they are reinfected, are more prone to get severe disease. So we have a very high disease uh, burden in, in Colombo. And uh, these 26,000 something cases which have been reported in Sri Lanka, uh, I mean, most of the cases which are treated by general practitioners and you know private hospitals and so on, and OPDs in, uh, in uh, government hospitals are unreported. So the actual burden of infection is uh, so much higher. Okay, thanks, Nilika. Uh, is there a possibility of an individualized vaccination program with 
serological studies? Is that too expensive? Um, it is too, e too expensive. We got the connection got lost. Hello, madam. I, th I think there was a brief break in the connection. All right, okay. Nilika, can you repeat the answer, please? Probably there must be a technical issue, sir. Yeah. Uh, until then, uh, until she, uh, we connect her again, we will move on to the next speaker. Dr. Viraj Jayasinghe, because Dr. Anand Vijayakram will be a little bit late, uh, joining us with a little bit late. Uh, so Dr. Viraj Jayasinghe, consultant pediatrician from LRH. So he will be speaking uh, today about the pediatric cases, uh, how to diagnose, uh, because the main idea of this session is to uh, educate our volunteer doctors from the SLMA doc call 247. Uh, to have a telephone conversation and give the red flags, identify the red flags, uh, give, the, give the basic instructions to the mothers and the adults and the family members. So Dr. Viraj will be speaking to us <coughs> about the pediatric cases. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Sajit. Uh, so good evening, everyone. So I'll be uh, talking about like how to, uh, when to suspect and what, what sort of OPD management could we give to children suspected of having dengue and so uh, basically uh, now as uh, Prof. Nirika mentioned earlier dengue is on the rise and we see it every day because we see uh, increase in the number of uh, patients are getting admitted with dengue hemorrhage fever to our wards and uh, so so when should we the question is when should we suspect uh, dengue in children so in a country like Sri Lanka where dengue is endemic so any child with a febrile illness unless until proven otherwise we have to suspect dengue right so uh, if a child has a febrile illness even with respiratory symptoms or having uh, a diarrheal illness still at the end of 48 hours of fever uh, we are warranted to do a full blood count so uh, basically uh, we can also do a dengue ns1 antigen even though it's not freely available in the government sector uh, NS1 antigen also would uh, give us some support uh, uh, in uh, picking up dengue cases. So it's more more also uh, positive in the first three days of uh, the illness. Afterwards, of course, the positivity slowly goes down. And uh, But just ha having a negative test, again, does not rule out uh, dengue. So it's not a must. If facilities are there, of course, you can do in the first three days. And But still, having a negative NS1 does not rule out dengue. Still, if you are clinically suspecting, you'll have to monitor the patient as having dengue. So, uh, there are, of course, other features pointing towards dengue, like if the patient is flushed or having uh, body aches, like because it's classically called the breakbone fever because it, it causes a lot of arthralgia, myalgia and body aches. And then again, vomiting, abdominal pain, right? Sometimes there may be a rash with dengue, right? And especially coming from a dengue endemic area. So we have to, uh, those are the pointers to say that, okay, it's more likely to be dengue. But then again, as I mentioned earlier, being in Sri Lanka, having a febrile illness for more than 48 hours, we have a full blood count is a must, right? So what does a full blood count? What will the full blood count show us? So, uh, basically, the classic full blood count in a dengue would, of, would show a leukopenia, especially a WBC below 5,000 and a platelet count below 150,000, a thrombocytopenia. But then again, one has to remember that uh, the initial counts, the maybe in day 3, day 4, this might be perfectly normal even. The platelet count will be normal, even the WBC will be normal, right? So even having a normal count and then you are worried about dengue actually because you can't find another focus or coming from a dengue endemic area, your suspicion is high. Then of course, the advice is if the platelet count is above 200,000, we'll have to repeat the count in a 24 hours time and then see whether where the count is heading towards, right? So if the platelet count is above 200,000 and you still think about a dengue, we'll have to repeat the full blood count in a 24 hour time period. And of course, uh, 
uh, if the platelet count is between 150 to 200, right? And um, then, uh, of course, the chance of it being dengue is higher. So then the advice is to repeat it 12 hours, right? So, so that we want to catch the people with the uh, dropping platelet count early and getting them to the hospital for monitoring. But then again, it can depend on the clinical discussion, but this is the general advice. So platelet count between 150 to 200, we'll have to repeat it 12 hourly. Platelet count above 200,000 and we are suspecting dengue, we'll have to repeat it 24 hours, uh, especially if the WBC is also lower than 5,000. Right. Now, so now there is a patient whom we suspect uh, to have dengue and there is a leukopenia and there is a thrombocytopenia. And now, should we manage this patient as an outpatient or should we uh, get the patient admitted? So, so, we look at the criteria for admission. So, when to advise for admission. So, one of course would be if there is a platelet count below 150,000. So, unlike in adults, uh, where the, I think they look at a platelet count of 100,000. But of course, in children, we advise if the platelet count is below 150,000 to get admitted to a pediatric ward. Right? And then the other criterion would be if the hematocrit shows a rise of about 10%, right? And you are suspecting dengue and the player, the, the, the hematocrit is, uh, has gone up by more than 10% from the baseline. Of course, uh, we might not know the baseline, but uh, generally in, in children in Sri Lanka, so we take the rough um, um, hematocrit to be around 35. In infants, of course, it might be even low as 32, 33, even 30, right? So in a, in a child, so just to tell you the gravity of this hematocrit, so uh, if, it's like, if, if the baseline hematocrit is 35, was 35, and the current hematocrit is 39, that means definitely it's a rise more than 10%. So then you have to treat this patient with caution, right? Because it's again a criterion for admission if you are thinking about dengue. But then of course, there are so many other reasons for the hematocrit to go up like dehydration and all those things. But in a patient with dengue, in a patient with dengue, if you are thinking that the plate, the hematocrit has gone up by 10%, it's a criterion for admission. Then the other criteria, uh, the criterion for admission would be a child with warning signs of dengue, right? So the warning signs would be a child with features suggestive of shock. Say the patient hasn't passed urine for the past six hours or mother says the patient has cold, clammy extremities, right? And the patient is drowsy, disoriented, right? And uh, so in that, that case, uh, it's important to get this patient immediately to the hospital, right? Especially if the output is less than six hours and cold, clammy extremities, and then um, he's uh, drowsy as well. And then again, uh, if there is history of uh, bleeding manifestations like mucosal bleeds, coffee ground, vomiting, right? And then passing tarry stools, right? So then these patients need to be uh, admitted uh, to the hospital. Uh, then again, uh, if there is abdominal pain, especially suggestive of right hypochondriac pain, this could be tender hepatomegaly. So there could be liver derangement. So these patients also need to be admitted. And then again, if, if a patient is vomiting, right, unable to keep oral fluids in, right, so high chance of dehydration. And especially if the patient starts leaking, so if he's already dehydrated, he might go into shock early. So those patients also, we need to uh, get them admitted early, right? So these are the criteria for, these are the basic criteria for admission. Uh, so the platelet count below 150, thrombus, uh, hematocrit pricing more than 10% and children with uh, warning signs of dengue. And then uh, there is another, uh, another uh, category where you consider early admission. So not all patients having dengue needs to be admitted with, in this category, but you consider early admission, especially uh, babies. So say uh, under one year infants. So because their platelet count drop could drop rapidly overnight, like say by about even 50,000, right? The platelet count we had seen like uh, the patient, uh, the, the uh, eight months, nine month old babies with a platelet count overnight of about 180,000. Next day you find uh, when you do the repeat count in the morning, it's about 90,000 and has started leaking also. They start leaking early. So you have to be, one has to be very cautious. So if it's an infant, have a low threshold for admission, right? Even despite not having those criteria that I mentioned earlier. And then obese children, because obese, uh, being having being obese is a risk factor for, uh, you know, complicated dengue, right? So, uh, and then of course, 
children with uh, comorbidities, other comorbidities like say renal diseases, heart diseases, right? So those patients also need to be considered to be admitted early. And then of course, adverse social circumstances like uh, patients unable to come for the count. So if there's a problem, they can't seek medical advice early. So if there are social issues, then again, those also need to be considered to be admitted early. And um, so uh, so those are the ones who need, uh, need to be admitted. So now we'll say that if there's a patient who doesn't have this admission criteria, but then of course, platelet count is between 150 to 200 and he's well. And uh, so we have advised him to repeat the count in a, another 12 hours time. Uh, so in the meantime, so if you are managing as an outpatient, uh, what I, I, the, the other thing uh, with, that I forgot to mention was clinically, if you examine if there's effusion or so, you know, like evidence of plasma leakage, like a, like a site is so effusion, then again, that also is a criterion for admission. So now the, this scenario where there is a patient without uh, fulfilling the criteria for admission, but uh, uh, but we are he's under watch for dengue, right? What sort of advice are we going to give them uh, to be ma managed as outpatients? So number one thing would be okay to give paracetamol in an appropriate dose and in an appropriate frequency. So most of the times, what happens is dengue patients, since the fever is a bit you know difficult, does not respond to paracetamol that well. So Sometimes parents tend to give it four hourly, sometimes even before that, or even higher doses. Even I had seen some GPs also doing that. So the, the dose would be 15 milligram per kilogram per dose, six hourly, or the accumulated dose for a day would be 60 milligram per kilogram per day, right? So we should not exceed that. So especially when you have a patient with dengue, always ask what is the dose of paracetamol that he's on, because that can cause liver derangement and complicate matters later. And then, of course, no a strict no to NSAIDs, either route by oral law via a suppository, it's strictly prohibited. And then no steroids as well, because that can complicate matters. Then, uh, of course, we have to ensure adequate fluid intake. So, so fluids in the sense, we should not just advise on hypotonic fluids like, like water. So we have to advise on things like Jivani or ORS, then Kanji, fruit juices, king coconut water, yeah, there are some solutes, right? And so what we generally do is we calculate the maintenance fluids. So we say, so the, as, you, as you can remember the holiday formula, so for the, for the first 10 kilos, it's 100 ml per kg, next 10 kilos is 50 ml per kg, and then uh, 20 ml per kg, then non-birds, right? So we'll say a, a 20 kilo child, it's 1,500 ml for a day, 24 hours, then you divide that by 24, right? So just see how much of uh, fluid is to be given per hour. So you tell that mother, so this much of fluid needs to be given to the child every hour early and make sure that child passes enough urine. And if the parents are educated, of course, you can ask them to measure also, but it's not strictly required, but make just tell them that, you know, this he has to pass urine regularly and then uh, tell them about the warning signs, right? So if these uh, signs are there, uh, like that I mentioned earlier, right? like vomiting, not being able to keep the fluids down, abdominal pain, all those things, bleeding, manifestation, especially in children who are menstruating, right? If there's uh, heavy menstrual bleeding, right? That sort of thing to return to the hospital immediately, right? So with that, you can safely manage them as outpatients. And then of course, but uh, I would suggest if the, the count is dropping and between 150 to 200, better to be seen by at least a doctor, like just to get the, uh, make sure that the patient is all right, right? And then um, to tell them about the warning signs, right? Um, so this is basically uh, about the, the outpatient uh, management of uh, dengue, I would want to say. And other thing is uh, sometimes even though like now we see, now these days we see they had been fever and they had done a full blood count on day one or two. And then afterwards child had been uh, at home and then child is uh, now AFA by for almost about one to one and a half days. And then uh, they bring the child to hospital because of vomiting or less active or be drowsy. Sometimes I've seen children coming 48 uh, after, hours after the settlement, uh, after the fever has settled uh, to find out that they had leaked a lot. So some are in shock, right? So it's very, uh, uh, because the parents think that, okay, fever has gone down and they are well, right? So, but uh, that's very detrimental. So you have to always tell them 
uh, when the fever settles, if child is clinically deteriorating, it's a warning sign. So they have to get the child immediately to the hospital, right? Uh, so that's something uh, to look out for. And then the other thing is we had seen children with uh, co-infections with influenza and dengue, uh, they, like, you know, their platelet counts also drop all of a sudden and then they leak very early and uh, they can, uh, you know, present with shock. So that also we have to be careful. So children with respiratory symptoms and then dengue could be influenza and uh, dengue together. So that also could be uh, something to, you know, be careful about. Um, so um, that's all I uh, thought would be important. So anything else, uh, Sajit, uh, any questions or anything that I would like to answer? Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Now the floor is open for discussion. So if you are having any questions, you can directly unmute and ask from Dr. Viraj. Or as previously uh, done, uh, you can use the chat option to send the questions. Uh, Sajit, maybe I uh, just would like to make a suggestion and request from Dr. Viraj now uh, for the benefit of the participants who may be volunteering for the 247 telemedicine service that yes. uh, if we can get a maybe a simple algorithm like we have done for mm -hmm. COVID, uh, ah, right, yeah. that would be very useful for everyone like I mean the admission criteria and different criteria that will take different different decisions that would be really useful. I'm sure those algorithms will be already available with you. If yeah. you can share with us and uh -huh. then we can share with our participants at 247 at SLMA. Right, I will do that. Thank you. Right, thanks. Uh, since we don't have any uh, questions at the moment, we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama, uh, consultant physician and uh, president elect of uh, SLMA for 2024. Uh, so he'll be talking about the adult uh, dengue patients and the managements, uh, the diagnosing criteria and the health advisors, home based management. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Sajid. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, SLMA, for organizing this. I think it's uh, very timely because we see uh, an unusual rise of uh, dengue uh, patients uh, considering the time of the year. Generally, in uh, March, April period, uh, the number of patients are quite less, the number of dengue patients are quite less. Uh, it is uh, in, uh, in late May and June, July period, the numbers are going up. But here we have a, a much higher number. And uh, so therefore there's a likelihood of getting a quite a big outbreak by the time we get monsoon rains, that is by end of, uh, by June, July period, uh, it is possible that we would get a very high number of patients. So, so it is important to discuss uh, this as well as important to discuss the preventive aspects as well. Um, and uh, I think Viraj covered most of the things, and, and I think uh, those are what he mentioned are applicable to adults as well. Uh, there are only minor differences. Now we see more and more adults uh, getting infected, and uh, because of comorbidities, the complications are more in adults. And also, adults tend to, a lot of adults tend to go to work in spite of having fever rather than waiting at home. And uh, especially uh, even young people, uh, either they would go for uh, exert themselves uh, or go to work again, exerting physically exerting, and these uh, issues tend to uh, lead to more complications. Uh, and another thing we see in adults is uh, compared to children probably is that uh, they come late to hospitals. Uh, when a child is ill, probably you take your child uh, early to the hospital, but when it comes to adult, uh, they, they come late. So that is one of the problems we are facing because sometimes they come in uh, shock and uh, that things can be different. Actually, the couple of uh, deaths which occurred uh, 
uh, across the country during the last uh, few months were due to late admissions. And uh, another problem we face with adult uh, dengue is uh, some general practitioners tend to treat these patients with NSAIDs and also dexamethasone. And recently we have seen using of betamethasone also. So this is very unfortunate uh, because these things, NSAIDs and steroids, all tend to cause uh, complications, more and more complications in these patients. Uh, there is a circular by the Ministry of Health uh, not to use NSAIDs in these patients, but unfortunately, uh, it is still happening uh, in some areas. And uh, uh, then uh, there are a couple of problems we have seen over the uh, years for these late admissions. One thing is uh, when they when the patient goes to the G, uh, GP, patient is given some medicines, and sometimes the fever settles. And uh, generally, a lot of general practitioners advise patients to do a blood count on day three. But uh, sometimes when the fe patient feels better, and when the fever is not there, uh, they would not get the blood count done, and they would not go for a follow-up. And by day five or six, then they go to the GPO, come to the hospital with complications. Uh, so it is important to advise patients to do a blood count, even if the fever settles by day three. Then if it is okay, then we know it's uh, quite safe, or uh, else we can follow up with another blood count on the, on the next day, depending on the results. So it is important in the present context because it is uh, the prevalence is increasing to advise all patients with fever to do a blood count on day three. Uh, and other uh, reason for delays uh, and not coming to hospital in time is the negative antigen test. Now antigen test is positive in about 70% of patients on average if it is done within first three days of uh, illness. Uh, so third, in 30% or so, it can be negative. Uh, therefore, if you are doing an antigen test, it is important to tell the patient that uh, if it is negative, still it can be dengue. So that is, it is important to tell the patient that fact. Uh, so that uh, they do a blood count on day three. Actually, we make decisions based on the blood counts, not based on antigen test results. Uh, it's okay to do that. If it is positive, we take it as uh, dengue. Uh, it can be positive in some other flaviviral infections, but those are not common in Sri Lanka. Therefore, if it is positive, we take it as dengue. But if it is negative, still it can be dengue. So that message has to go to the uh, patient. And uh, then another reason for delay in, uh, in uh, coming to the hospital is the delay in getting the reports. The patient may have given a blood to a, uh, to a lab, say, uh, this evening. He will be getting the report next morning. And by that time, the count, uh, if it is a low count, then things can be bad. The patient may, may, may have already got complications. So therefore, when you are asking a patient to do a blood count, especially if it is on day four or five, uh, make sure that the, the patient receives results within three, four hours at least. And then there should be a way of follow up uh, for, the, for the doctor uh, to see the result. Or you should educate the patient to uh, get admitted if the count drops less than 130 or 120 or so. Uh, if it is going towards that, tr the trend is towards that, it's better to admit patients. Uh, and as Viraj said, uh, we have a low threshold to admit uh, patients with other issues like patients with comorbidities, elderly patients, and uh, then uh, obese patients and pregnant mothers. Pregnant mothers we have to admit as uh, early as possible and follow up because pregnant mothers are more likely to develop uh, complications in dengue. And also uh, the, the monitoring parameters also can be different. So therefore, the, we have to admit the um, And if the patients are admitted timely, then I think most, even if they complica get complications more in, most, uh, in most of the occasions, we can uh, handle these complications. Uh, of, often the problem is that get, they come late with complications. Uh, and then uh, while at home, uh, it is easy to calculate fluid for adults. Generally, most of the adults are more than 50 kilos of weight. So we advise them to take about two and a half liters of liquids for a day. Uh, and uh, 
uh, you you generally you don't have to calculate to the weight unless they are less than 50 kilos of uh, weight uh, so it's easy for it's in the case of adults rather than in children and we advise them to take uh, liquids with solutes like uh, king coconut water orange juice uh, lime juice then kanji uh, jivani uh, the sort of uh, liquids rather than plain water i mean plain water is not prohibited but it's better to have uh, liquids with solutes and another thing as uh, uh, another problem we feel from patient side or more than patient side from parents side uh, or spouse side that the patient cannot eat so it is uh, we have to explain the uh, patients and the family that most of the time they cannot eat and that is uh, the nature of the illness but if they can drink enough uh, then uh, that is adequate as long as they are the counts are not going down or as long as they don't have features mentioned by Viraj, which necessitate uh, ad, uh, early admission. Uh, so most of the time they need only uh, uh, most of the time they need only paracetamol and uh, and, uh, and and antiemetic like domperidone. That's that's more uh, that's what is necessary. So don't uh, bombard these patients with uh, vitamins and uh, other other drugs. Uh, if they have, some patients can have some respiratory symptoms like a sore throat and uh, dry cough, so maybe you can give a, give an antihistamine if you think it, it might help. But other than that, uh, they don't need uh, other treatment often. Uh, if the patients are on aspirin, clopidogrel, uh, warfarin, or any other anticoagulant, we stop all those when the uh, when the clinical clinical diagnosis of dengue is made. Um, and but of course then we need to monitor these patients with regular blood counts um, so or uh, when it when we think of uh, the 247 services uh, most of the time the questions will be uh, when to get admitted and whether to get admitted with these things so uh, as i said one of the question uh, one of the problem they perceive is this uh, uh, the inability to eat uh, that of course is not an indication for admission but if they cannot drink or if they have persistent vomiting then of course they need to get admitted and uh, during the recent months we have seen patients some patients coming with uh, profuse diarrhea also so that had become a, a symptom uh, and uh, such patients also needs to be admitted uh, because they cannot drink enough adequately to compensate the loss of volume uh, due to diarrhea uh, and occasionally patients can have uh, persistent vomiting so they should be admitted uh, but otherwise uh, they can be managed at home with regular monitoring so monitoring means from at the end of day two at the end of 48 hours of fever we do a blood count uh, we, we do a blood count and then uh, we follow it up general most of the time the plated count drops for six days and on the seventh day it starts to go up the white count starts dropping before that with the reverse changing of uh, neutrophil lymphocyte percentage uh, neutrophil percentage goes down and the lymphocyte percentage goes up and, uh, and the, the, that's the usual pattern and then the uh, new white cell count starts increasing by end of uh, by day five end of day five and the platelet count follows so that's the that's the most the usual pattern and that again has to be explained to the patient it is common to so we we need to explain to these patients that it is common to see this platelet drop and not to get worried about the platelet drop because uh, we we are not prophylactically treating the low platelet count uh, to stop aspirin and other anticoagulants there's no cut off uh, plate at uh, count when the dengue is diagnosed we stop that there's an even counts even with a count of 180 to 100,000 we stop that because we know the plate will go down and not only it goes down these plates are dysfunctional even with the higher count they are dysfunctional so uh, they don't clot uh, so this is a bleeding disorder so we can safely stop that and also the even after stopping the aspirin action will be there for another 48 to 72 hours so we can uh, safely stop that even in patients who had uh, myocardial infarction or or stenting uh, 
Uh, but if the patient had uh, things like uh, uh, if the patients are on warfarin, then best thing is to admit those patients because we need to monitor the INR also or in, in this situation, so better to admit such patients. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, then another another question patients come up, not more than patients, again, the, fam the parents come up with is the not settling of uh, uh, not settling of fever and that of course is a common thing again and it is important to tell i think viraj uh, also mentioned this it is important to tell these patients uh, that fever might not settle fully with paracetamol but do not use other things like nsas for the fever uh, the fe fever will not kill the patient so if the fever is not settling uh, they can do uh, some tepid sponging and keep the keep a fan on and so you advise them to use this sort of uh, measures and then there can be occasional patient who has uh, paracetamol allergy uh, of course we cannot give any other drug to them for fever uh, there's a question whether to stop warfarin yes we stop warfarin uh, in dengue patients if when, they, when we diagnose dengue and uh, uh, and all, all anticoagulants uh, has to be stopped because that can lead to uh, complications if there's a problem. Um, uh, there is a question in critical phase of full bolus of fluid that have been started for a patient in the the basis of wrong clinical assessment where actual bolus is not necessary in which should we have to follow it tail of regime uh, okay. if the bolus was given uh, unnecessarily it's not not necessary to tail off uh, then you can uh, come back to the necessary fluid uh, maintainers fluid uh, do we use uh, do we start not this one to all the patients with menstruation at all stages of dengue, actually more than nortestone, what is necessary is to start them on tranexamic acid. If they have bleeding, start on tranexamic acid. If the bleeding is not responding to tranexamic alone, then we can start nortestone also, uh, because the nortestone action actually takes little time. Uh, so the tranexamic has a quicker action. So the starting tranexamic is better. It's important. You can start both, but the tranexamic is the, the more important one. Should you start antibiotics if the patient develops neutropenia? No, neutropenia is a common common feature in the course of the illness. Uh, sometimes neutrophil, uh, the total white cell count can drop even below 1000. Uh, so the neutrophil count can go below 500, but this is a very transient thing. We don't have to start the prophylactic antibiotic to these patients. But if the fever persists for more than five days, then think of starting uh, antibiotics because that persistent fever may be due to a uh, secondary infection or else if you suspect a co-infection due to uh, some other illness with dengue like leptospirosis sometimes we see patients with leptospirosis and dengue uh, or a patient with pneumonia and dengue in such patients we, if you have an alternative diagnosis also then start immune antibiotics uh, so there's we don't use antibiotics to prevent secondary infections if they get secondary infections only we treat them uh, two common secondary infections are there those are the thrombophobitis and then gram negative uh, bacteremia are uh, causing sometimes causing sepsis uh, generally comes with uh, intra-abdominal infections uh, as i said earlier there's another question regarding stopping platelets or no no cutoff of platelet to stop uh, anti uh, coagulants or aspirin if the uh, when they recover when the platelet count goes starts going up there's no no definite evidence to say at what level we should restart but generally what we do is when it goes up to about 130 or four above then we restart them on aspirin and other uh, or anticoagulants uh, role for platelet transition in menorrhagia no if the, if the bleeding is severe, you give blood, uh, not platelet. Uh, so actually, there's no 
uh, no place for prophylactic transfusions. If the patients continue to bleed, or if the patients, sometimes we have patients who had complications who tend to bleed, and this bleeding is often occult. Uh, in spite of giving a couple of transfusions, in those patients, we we have to consider therapeutic platelet transfusions, but otherwise we don't use uh, prophylactic trains, uh, prophylactic uh, pro platelet transfusions. Um, how to differentiate leptospirosis and dengue by investigations? Now, yeah, that is clinically, it can be quite difficult to differentiate the two. Uh, so you have to, especially in uh, areas prevalent with leptospirosis, you have to consider both. Uh, and if you think of leptospirosis clinically, start them on antibiotics, but monitor them as for dengue. Uh, and by day three, four, you see the reversal neutrophil count, the white cell count going down, and the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, a reversal of ratio. And then we know it is not leptospirosis, this dengue, then you can stop antibiotics. Uh, otherwise, if the, uh, in the in leptospirosis, we see the white cell count uh, will continue to be at a higher level. Uh, at least at the high normal level, and uh, the neutrophil percentage will be uh, will continue to be high. Any possibility of patients with compensatory shock with adequate urine output? Of course, yes. Some patients can have uh, normal urine output, adequate urine output, in spite of being in shock. So don't go only by the urine output. Uh, can you please explain about the fluid management? That, of course, is a long topic. Uh, so I don't think we can discuss it at this uh, session. Maybe we'll have a separate discussion on that. Uh, any possibility of compensatory shock? Uh, can we start steroids beforehand for developing HLH? No, HLH is very rare. It is very rare. Uh, so there's no place for prophylactic steroids. That's uh, uh, not, no, not at all. No place for prophylactic steroids. If the patient is allergic to paracetamol, there's no option of giving other drugs, but uh, you can do tepid sponging and uh, keep a fan and uh, I think the uh, Can we give dextran 350? No, dextran we give 500 boluses for an adult, that is 10 ml per kg, or sometimes we give 5 ml per kg over half an hour. Antihypertensives we continue uh, unless their pressure drops. So we know they are normal, normal base, their normal baseline of pressure is with antihypertensives. So we maintain that, we try to maintain that. So we know they are they are no that's the, they are normal. Otherwise, uh, in the question somebody has asked if omitted any difference of interpreting BP trends. Yes, it can be defeated. It's a problem. So that's why we don't stop antihypertensives. Um, yeah, I think that is uh, basically what I want to say. Uh, place of calcium in leaking phase, if there's a, a fair amount of leaking, most of the, these patients are having hypocalcemia. So uh, empirically, you can give calcium to patients who have significant amount of leaking, not just mild leaking, uh, significant amount of leaking. Uh, can we use celecoxib? No, silicoxib is also a, also a type of NSA, so we can't use silicoxib. Any indication for platelet transfusion? Not because of low platelet, I, as I said earlier, we don't give prophylactic platelet transfusion. If the patient continues to bleed in spite of having three, four blood transfusions, then we give uh, platelet also as a therapeutic. If the patient develops dengue hepatitis, is there a place so acid? Uh, dengue hepatitis is quite common actually. A lot of these patients will have uh, uh, some degree of elevation of uh, liver enzymes, generally around 200. So, and occasionally we see patients. Uh, yeah, going uh, enzymes going above 1000 without the patient going into shock. Most of the time, if the enzymes goes above 1000 or to high levels around 800, 900 levels, the reason is 
the hypovolemic shock. So the treatment is the correction of hypovolemia. Without correcting hypovolemia, giving acidioxycholic acid, the neck or whatever, is not going to be helpful. What is necessary is to correct the intravascular volume so that the liver perfusion will get uh, corrected. Uh, what stage dengue myocarditis develop? Um, dengue myocarditis, at least cardiomyopathy, we don't know whether it is uh, carditis or not. Some It's a sort of pathological diagnosis. But uh, it's, uh, we see some patients, if you do a course in, say, 100 patients, you might see uh, about 15, 20 patients having uh, patchy areas of hypokinesia or global hypokinesia with somewhat reduced ejection fraction. That's not uncommon, but that does not affect the management. Do not reduce fluid due to the suspicion of myocarditis. And we have seen deaths happening uh, due to reducing of fluid due to the suspicion of myocarditis. So the fluid management should continue irrespective of card, car, heart or the kidney or whatever. Uh, what are the indices for starting critical phase monitoring, uh, platelet level, ultrasound findings? Yeah, in the ultrasound, if you find leaking, then we start the critical phase monitoring. Uh, platelet level, no, but leaking most of the time starts when the platelet count goes below 100,000. So when it goes below the part, that doesn't mean everybody has uh, leaking after that. But when it goes below 100,000, you have to look for leaking. Uh, what is the place on neck if uh, the AST is more than 1,000? Uh, as I said earlier, the, in most of the time, the high, recent high liver enzymes is the hypovolemic shock. So whatever, before you do anything else, you have to correct the uh, volume, intravascular volume. So for, without correcting that, whether you use neck or acidioxycholic acid or whatever, it's not going to be helpful. Statins, uh, we don't have to stop. Statins, you can continue. CRP to exclude DF. Uh, CRP is generally little high in uh, dengue, around uh, 25, 30, that sort of range. Uh, occasionally, we have seen patients who had uh, 80s, 90s. Uh, so if we have seen, then uh, we uh, it, it high like that, we suspect uh, secondary infection also. But uh, generally, it is little high. Um, pericholecystic fluid we don't take only as uh, leaking if it is more than that we take it as leaking that is the fluid in the hepatorenal pouch or effusion management of prolonged dengue prolonged dengue means uh, the leaking can get prolonged in patients who has complicated who have complications severe complications but uh, otherwise uh, there's very rarely, the dengue fever can go on for more than 10 days, but that is very rare. Can the patient have shock or leaking without evidence of uh, leaking in the ultrasound, reason, uh, ultrasound scan? What is the reason for that? Uh, patients can have shock due to bleeding or dehydration due to other reasons like vomiting or loose motion. So when if a patient is in shock, all these can, can contribute to vomiting, loose motion, bleeding, leaking. All this can contribute. So you have to have a good history and assess the patient. And also you have to do on-site PCVs to see whether the patient is bleeding. Uh, we, have do, we have to do PCVs in the lab, in, in the road rather. Uh, uh, and then uh, sometimes we might not uh, detect leaking in time if the leaking is little. Depends on the operator. And also we, now we uh, ideally we have to keep the patient positioned for some time before doing that, but it's very practical. It's not happening. It's difficult to do. Uh, we didn't take on patients with end stage CKD on dialysis. I advise them to take their usual advice free intake. Generally, a lot of people might uh, are advised to take only one liter per day. So take that, not, not extra. Can dengue fever patients have polyuria when they recover without leaking? Yes, some patients have that. Yes. What drugs to be stopped in dengue patients apart from antiplatelet uh, and uh, so there is aspirin, clopid, and other uh, and anticoagulants, warfarin, and other. There are new anticoagulants which are now we use. 
uh, in the use. Fluid protocol during equilibrium phase, uh, those are a bit too detailed for this discussion. Uh, is there ICH risk uh, when rate uh, is very low? Uh, dengue is a bleeding, dengue, especially dengue hemorrhagic fever, is a bleeding disorder. So they can bleed. And the bleeding does not depend on the platelet count. Uh, we have had patients whose platelet counts are zero. Uh, and also we have had patients who had bleeding at various levels of platelet. So it's not related to the platelet count. Uh, expected drop in PCV after normal saline 500 bolus, uh, maybe uh, one or two of PCV drop after dextran bolus, 10 ml per kg. Usually we expect to see a drop of PCV by eight or ten, eight to 10 and uh, rise of PCV of about by about five to six with the blood transfusion. What is the minimum PCV before initiating uh, dextran? No, dextran, we don't give dextran just because the PC of uh, high PCV. Uh, so it has to depend on the how much the fluid had been given, what, uh, what place the patient is in the critical phase. So uh, considering all that, we have to decide giving dextran. So those are actually the detailed things in the management, uh, but our main idea of today's discussion is to actually uh, answer the questions we are likely to face in day-to-day -day advi uh, advices given to patients, uh, and also when to admit these patients, the correct time of admission, and uh, uh, so that uh, we can make sure that they come to hospital in time. As dexan cause drop in PCV by 10, do we have to have a minimum PCV of 25? Uh, no, this drop is the expected drop, but if it drops below the baseline, then we have to think of bleeding. Have you seen patients start leaking above 100,000 of platelet? Yes, but very rare. Very rare. So that is why in the guideline we say we make these guidelines for the for the common presentations, which are applicable to most of the patients. Always there can be outliers, uh, but we can't have guidelines for outliers. That is the issue. Uh, it's very rare to have patients uh, leaking uh, above the count, above a platelet count of 100,000, but uh, rarely that can happen. Uh, other category that happens especially is the pregnant mothers. In pregnant mothers, the leaking occurs at a much higher level. Generally, they start leaking when the platelet count is around 130,000 or so. So in those patients, we have to do frequent PCV monitoring and frequent ultrasound scans uh, much before the platelet count drops below 100,000. So I think uh, we have uh, uh, there's a question briefly explain fluid management of CKD patients. Uh, that's uh, that is a detailed uh, uh, discussion and explanation. Sorry, too much for today. Uh, any specific difference in the management of pregnant mothers? Yes, 
we, uh, as I said earlier, the, they tend to leak early. So we need to monitor them more uh, carefully and start monitoring early. And also there are the threshold values uh, for interventions are different. Uh, yeah, those things we have given in the pregnant uh, guideline of for pregnancy in dengue. Uh, um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, sir. So we had a very uh, good and lengthy discussion about uh, dengue infection and how are the brief outline of the management. So to continue the session, I would like to hand over to Professor Indi Karnati uh, to do the rest of the session. Uh, thank you very much, Sajit. And uh, we had a very fruitful session and uh, also very interactive discussion and a lot of clarifications were cleared and I would like to thank the three resource persons, Professor Neelika, Dr. Ananda, Vijay Vikram and Dr. Viraj Singha for sharing your expertise that was really useful and a lot of areas were clarified and the presentations were made very clear and the main focus of uh, today's discussion was basically again to reactivate the 247 service related to uh, dengue as well and also mainly to focus on the decision regarding when to admit and when to have the lower threshold i think uh, that objective was made very clear by the presenters so with that we can conclude the session before that i would like to make a request again from the resource persons if we if you can share your guidelines with us then we can share with our audience and also the 247 team and we will be sharing this video with all the 247 volunteers as well and again just a reminder that the service is still active and if you are part of the 247 it's a matter of dialing 248 248 and then press in one then you can log into the system and uh, we can again ad start advertising that uh, the service is available related not only for covid but also about dengue as well so maybe again this is a request and an invitation from all of you again to rejoin it's pretty simple uh, dial 248 and then you can log in okay and we'll formalize that service as time goes on maybe we'll start with sharing this video with all the two person groups and then to reactivate our service and with that we would like to conclude and i would like to invite dr sajit uh, singer make the concluding remarks over to you dr sajit uh thank you very much sir. uh so i would like to thank again uh, to all our resource people uh Professor Neelika Kamalavige, who is a professor in immunology from Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayadhanapura, and Dr. Viraj Jai Singh, consultant pediatrician from LRH, and Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama, president elect and consultant physician uh, from IDH. So, thank you very much, uh, dear madam, dear sir, uh, for participating us and giving your valuable comments, valuable ideas, the thoughts, and uh, encouraging our trainees and our doctors and updating their knowledge. So on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to thank you once again. And thank you once again, the dear participants. And uh, I saw there were a lot of requests about this dengue fluid management. So I will discuss with uh, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama and I will uh, probably by next week or week after the next, we will arrange another session uh, about, especially about uh, dengue fluid management. So we can discuss in detail about this fluid management in that session. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant evening.